good to have Travis Kerber back uh, after the, the holidays. We got Travis back on the podcast today. You can find our podcast on iTunes and Apple and on Spotify as well. But today's topic, Travis, is uh, at least a, a lead in here, is I, I recall back from our years of teaching together and at the beginning of this, we try to make hitting and pitching as I would call it standardized, but you know, standardized or objective as possible. And I won't call that a cookie cutter a way to hit it to teach hitting or pitching either, but I will say we spoke a lot in absolutes. And the longer that we're doing this now, I say, yeah, we used to talk about like. 10 absolutes then we got down to seven and then we went down to five and I think the last time that we spoke about this probably a year ago and in some conference like I don't know that there's I would hang my hat on any one absolute right now what why do you think and I have some ideas on this but I'm just curious to to why we've eliminated those in your opinion over time well, to me, like, I think a lot of it started, you know, when we were coming up and learning baseball, when there wasn't anything other than what our eyes told us about the swing. So when I go back to that, you know, my first thought I was goes to probably the first cue that I was ever told as a hitter, and that was squish the bug. And it was a simple, hey, look, your foot needs to turn so your hips can turn so you can swing and turn your hips as far as you possibly can into your swing, but you got to release that foot. That foot really has to spin. And I remember going back after we started having video and looking at like, well, why, why was this, why was this either good or bad? Because at that point I didn't know that it wasn't squish the bug. Even when I first really started coaching, because even through college, it was, you know, turn your back foot, even if they didn't say squish the bug or, you know, and we started looking at, the the video when we could actually slow it down going back to the right view pro again and you would see that with our with our naked eye you'd see the foot start in whatever position it was and then you'd see that at some point it finished rotated turned back but what you didn't see because most people weren't staring number one at one single movement you were staring at just somebody swinging and you would notice that okay well the body starts to turn the hip essentially lifts the foot and then as the weight hits the front leg the weight then eventually pushes back to the back leg after it's done moving into the ball so what you would see is you would just see the foot start in one place and then you'd see it finish with like the heel behind the ball of the foot in a typical squish the squish the bug position and so as you looked at that it was like oh we got to squish the bug because it starts here and ends there but nobody was accounting for all the things the foot was essentially doing in between getting from here to there. It was just, this is where it started and this is where it ends. So when we talk absolutes, I think that's a lot of what it was. It was like, well, this has to happen, but we weren't really like, Hey, why does this happen? What are all the little things that are causing that to happen in between? Um, and then, you know, one of the biggest things I would say would be probably us starting to understand that, you know, not everybody can move the same as somebody else based on body positions. You know, what do you got on that? Yeah, that's what, that's what I wrote down here in my notes is, uh, as you were speaking is uh, movement types. And the more you get into um, seeing just the, <laughs> the wide spectrum in, in the spectrum to me, as uh, you know, I delve into scouting a little bit now is the hardest ones are the 17 and 18 year olds. And really you can go down because, because we teach 15 and 16 year olds too in the academy because their movement profiles are the widest range of the spectrum because you will get some 15 to 18 year olds that are a little more physically mature, advanced, stronger, and you get some that are just completely lax and you can't always see that from the surface. And so their movement profile is going to lead into just a, a completely different swing profile. And I'll give you an example of one that has come up recently. And uh, the connotation of an arm bar has always been negative, correct? and say, oh, you can't, can't hit with an arm bar. That's a, a strike against a hitter. And I said to a, an instructor that was trying to fix somebody with an arm bar, I said, you know, I wouldn't really worry about the arm bar. He's a really loose mover. And it's an arm bar is a natural way to take slack out of the system. The body will just do it because it's going to try to create a stretch. And if it can't stabilize that stretch through strength, it's going to find an, another way to create it. And the arm bar is a way of just like 
pulling it tight from, from the upper body. And then you look at somebody like King Griffey Jr., who, you know, had a lot of success with the arm bar. Um, I would venture to say, because he has as much or more torque than just about any hitter in the history of the game, that he was a really loose mover. And we haven't done a movement assessment on him. But going back to your point is those movement types are going to change the style of the hitter and is why that we are so adamant on um, – we aren't going to prescribe movement, which is a drill, to a hitter until we know what that movement profile is. And that's that, that kind of goes into the styles camp, right? And people seek out information on social media today or YouTube, and there's a lot of it out there. And if you're a parent or an amateur coach, youth coach, you're like, what, how do I sift through all this crap and find out what's really helpful – my advice to you is if somebody is locked into a style, usually those that bark the loudest have the most to hide. Because if you're hanging your, or you're putting your flag on one hole, albeit an ant hole at times, um, and you're putting all your apples into that basket, if it is a style, you're going to be crushed by absolutes, meaning you're saying all these things have to happen to be successful and that will work for a minority of the population, but it's not going to work for the girls whole. So my advice to anybody is like, understand how the movement affects the outcome of what you were saying, Travis, because that truly to me is where we need to start with our teaching. If you don't understand that it's easy to knock it because it takes a long time to learn, but I, I, I don't, I don't joke about this. When people say, where do I need to start if I want to get better as a hitting instructor, I, and I, you've heard me say this a number of times, I said, start with a kinesiology textbook. And baseball purists would be pissing at us. Oh, shit, that, what the hell does that have to do with, with hitting? I was like, a lot. Like, if you can't understand how the body works as a system and flows piece into piece, and you just said it in the squish the bug analogy, there's so much that happens. And, and the, I'll just talk about it here. The foot's roll in the, in the swing, in the setup is my foot is placing pressure in the ground to hold a back leg load. And we're gonna do that from the back half of our foot to ignite our posterior chain. So that's the glutes and the hamstrings. Next, that anchoring of the back shoe is gonna allow for good tempo. Good tempo often can lead to good sequencing. So my ability to control my body in dynamic balance, control my body for an extended period of time on one leg in the stride. If a player one can't control that, then you need to modify how they are striding to give them better body control. Into landing, rotation is probably going to begin if the hitter is on time. So now the role of the back shoe is to create tightness by trying to stay anchored against the rotating middle of the body, which will be linked around the pelvis, but there's a ton of muscles that factor into that. So as that pelvis and those strong muscles of the core win that battle, the shoe is going to turn inward and often is going to be a complete reflection of what the front leg is doing. So if the front leg is closed or strides across, the back leg, back leg is going to be almost equal and opposite to that. It's going to scissor. It's going to kick out. If it's more of a natural rotation with the feet online, you're going to see the, the shoe do more of an inward turn then rotate up onto the toe. And then, as you said earlier, ricochet. Now, I just explained in very short terms, that was a short winded answer. What the back shoe does in a variety of movements, all caused by different functions of the body that if you don't understand, you're going to have a hard time coaching. That's my soapbox right there, Travis. <laughs> yeah. I think, you know, one of those things, like, as you, as you think about it, you know, going back to like the thought of even absolutes and then, you know, understanding the body is, you know, how much a person, how much person A has to load versus person B has to load based on whether they are more of a stiff mover or more of a loose mover and how much range of motion that they have, you know, absolutes of, you know, just talking lower half stuff of, you know, I remember how many times coaches would sit and draw lines on the ground, like, oh, your feet got to land completely closed in a straight line directly at the pitcher because, that's that's how we do what we do. Different Did you have a stride box at any yeah. point? Not well, not to not to knock my college coach because he was a really good coach, but I remember striding against a stride box and I think to myself, "Why the hell am I doing this? I can't open my lower body, and I feel like I'm now cutting myself off and running out of space." Right. right. But then going back to your movement assessment, if I didn't know that my hips are super tight and always have been in internal rotation, 
that's a really bad cue for me. Why was my foot opening up? Because I had no mobility in my hip. But it was an absolute back then. Yeah. It was an absolute. True. This is what you do. You got to start in this setup with your hands in a certain position. Like you start putting people in these boxes, like you're talking about, you put people in these boxes and like people are fighting to get back out of these boxes because it just doesn't fit how they move, which is why it's really hard to have any absolute. And that doesn't mean there's not a general principle like, hey, you know, energy has got to get from point A through all these different points to get out eventually the bat. But there's so many different ways to get that to happen. You know, we've seen through the years, we've seen guys that, you know, we look at the swing as a whole and we're like, man, that swing doesn't quite look like it fits the normal mold. And you just watch that guy go out and just barrel baseballs mm -hmm. against the highest pitching. And obviously, you know, probably who I'm referring to with that, you know, one of our guys, Ethan, that was coming up with us. Yeah, I was thinking Ethan Skinner. Yeah, he's with the Padres yeah. now. I said the be best thing I ever did coaching that kid was not changing him. Right. But that's you, very easy for a coach to do because it can look awkward, right? It didn't look – well, it just didn't look how you would see a real swing, but he would get himself and his body into every position he needed to to hit the ball. He just did it in a different-looking way. So – you know, you get certain other people too, like, right. You get people like, man, like, wow, I've really coached this kid up and he looks really good. And you're like, why is he not barreling the ball? Right. You and know? what's looking good mean? I don't know. Looking good to our subjective eye of what a swing should look like. That's a really good point. But that's what it was. It was, oh, well, that looks like what we think it's supposed to look like, you know, but that doesn't mean that somebody's barreling the ball there either. So, I mean, you know, as you look at a lot of those different things, I think it's just, there's been so long that it's had to been, everything's had to been laid out one way. And the game is changing at this point. Now the game is changing really fast. Like when we first started going through what we were going through, you know, we were the, in my mind, we were like the outsiders. Like we were talking about things and people like, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, so you say, I can't do this. But it was all these different things. And now like for where it's at, like every day, it's like, man, like I feel like things are happening so fast because you are getting a bigger portion of the crowd that is understanding that human movement is important. And you're getting a lot of strength and conditioning people at this point that are now starting to branch out and do some of the baseball training as well, because they have such a good idea of body movement and how multiple pieces factor into the whole of, of human movement. So, you know, for, for, parents out there again you know or even other coaches that are you know continuing to try to get through their learning or even players that are listening you know I think like you said the best thing you can do is start to even self-educate yourself in little, little things and then use good sources or people that you know are continually trying to evolve because again like we don't I don't know it all right now like I know you you'll say the same thing about yourself you know, and I think those are the people you're trying to find is that people that are working to constantly figure out how can we make this easier for everybody? How can we see, how can we see through a lot of the other stuff and help the individual, you know? So I'll, I'll say that that's a, a, to toot your horn a little bit, Travis, like you've always been idea wise ahead of me. Um, and we've said it on this podcast before, a lot of times my role is to process things that you are thinking about that are usually very abstract and try to make it a narrower focus. And I remember, oh man, three or four years ago that you said, I don't think the lower body's role, and correct me if I'm wrong here, is speed creation. And I'm thinking to myself, we were, I was doing the, the 3D analysis on KVEST a lot of that time we were testing it. And I, and I just kept looking that there was no way that it a poor pelvis score in rotational degrees per second, angular velocity, would ever equate to a good output of the bat's angular velocity. And I was searching for speed. We talked about this in a podcast a while back. Now, now four years later, here's, here's how I've grown. It's like, I'm not even so sure that I, I care about really high rotational degrees per second because if you can't transfer it into linear velocity, it's, you're probably spinning off the ball anyway. But you said, and I was thinking to myself, like, man, I don't, I can't, I'm not buying into this. I know you're saying it, Travis. And then we, we did the study with producer Dan, where he hoisted me in the air and we, we were in a gymnastic studio and I put the K vest on and I did a, a, a variety of swings. I did one on flat ground. I did one on a deep trampoline and I did one hoisted in the air. 
and I'll, oh, I get, I just get butchered on Twitter for the hoisted in the air too, all the time. They, 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 some people, I think I'm actually like doing a drill in the air or something. Little do they know that I, I chuckle at it as well. And I actually use that, that same thing that they're making fun of me for and trying to say, I'm like some hitting guru that uh, came from Mars uh, in a negative way. I use that in my own speeches on stage to make fun of myself of how my brain is demented. So and they failed on that regard. But um, I came out of that study saying that the lower body's role is for stability to allow the middle to turn more effectively. And I won't even say faster, I'll say more effectively. And a lot of that's just about creating space too for the upper body to get through. And you had that in your mind four years, three years before I tested. I, and, I, and I'm more analytical than you are. And I didn't buy in until like, well, yep, we tested it. Man, he's right again. Yeah, but it, 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 even that, it wasn't, it wasn't like me trying, like in my mind, like, again, I just sit around and I'm like, man, I just don't feel like, I don't feel like from the data that I've kind of seen at that point, from the way that, you know, as I watch people move or even like, I'll always stand up and do stuff myself. I'm like, all right, I'm gonna try this out. I don't see what this feels like when I do this. And I sat there because like, it was so, for so many years, it was like, man, like your lower half creates all the power. And I'm like, man, I don't, I feel like everything comes. Yeah, that's a good way of saying it. Right. I feel like everything comes for me from like the middle. And again, you know, this was however many years ago that we had that first conversation about that. And we just sat down. I remember trying to say, I'm like, Justin, here's what I think, man. I think, I think. I didn't tell you were wrong. I just, that, that was again, one of those times where I was silent, but instead of being silent for two days to process it, I was silent for like three years. But it could have been, it could have been the same thing of like, you know, we could, there's so many things too that I've come to you with that I'm like, Hey, here's what I think. And then like, We'll go through and, you know, you'll come back to me, you know, a couple weeks later and be like, hey, you know, here's what I got on this. And then we'd sit and talk. I'm like, yeah, you know, I, I'm probably a little bit off on this one. Like, but it was just, it was one of those things that I think, again, because like even for me initially to think about that idea and then to even look at some of the, some of the data we had initially was more like, what else have we been told and what else have we been thinking our whole lives that maybe is actually throwing us off it's probably was T turning your hips fast that cue is probably throwing you off and farther yeah. for most people opening their True. hips yeah. more opening, your hips, yeah. opening your hips more is completely worse than anything you could do depending on what kind of mover you are now for some people you're going to have to rotate your hips farther but for some people rotating your hips farther is going to kill your swing yeah i, I deal with that a lot with older athletes of the over rotation um, to the pole side, which goes back to, oh man, we really got to train D cell because if the body can't slow down that turn abruptly or stop it, right, to maintain your direction, it's going to do so over a longer range. So the body's perception is I'm safe, right? And then yeah. that kill your direction. Not not to cut off your point there, but no, that was that's that's literally the point, you know. And that's I just and there's so, like again, there's some people that do need to turn farther, and there's where you go back to the whole beginning of you know what what do we know from the absolutes? And the absolutes are there are there are no absolutes, man. Like like yes, the body at some point, if you're trying to play at a high level, if you're going to talk like an absolute, I'm like, hey, for an absolute, at some point, you're going to have to be able to decel from segment to segment, or you're not going to be able to get up to speed on time. But at that point, we're just talking about, we're talking about more of like what needs to happen, not even from, you know, a certain standpoint, it's like for you to hit 95, you have to be able to get from A to B very rapidly, which means you're going to have to be able to get up to speed and shut down segments to get the next segment to keep speeding up to get there on time, or you're going to have to cheat. And once you start to cheat, you're going to make bad decisions because you have to decide early and you get to that high of a level and you're trying to cheat on a guy throwing 95 that's got a hammer and a nasty changeup. Well, that cheating is going to get you a couple of victories along the way, but there's going to be a ton of strikeouts. There's going to be a ton of mishit balls simply because you're, you're committing to only have to be able to hit one thing because you can't do anything else. That's a good point. So I'm going to, I'm going to stop you there because you and I both agree that, and Rachel and I talked about this last week, that timing is still the most important element of hitting. And we talked about that spectrum last week and I saw your, your Twitter scores producer Dan, and they were very consistent with what Rachel and I talked about with mechanics being the lowest of those things that we feel like are very important good hitters. However, 
with those guys that you're talking about that have poor D cell. And you said there's going to be there's going to be rewards in there. You're gonna you're gonna hit on a couple of the fastballs that you were cheating on, but you're just going to be so exposed. And at the professional level, these are the these are the hitters that frustrate fans the most. The guy that'll hit just moonshots and then strike out 150 times. This is the the Rob Deere version of your your Milwaukee Brewers, right? Like Rob Deere, mammoth power, swing and miss a ton. Are, that's where, in my opinion, a guy that can make a hitter more mechanically efficient can reduce that strikeout number because you can do things that will improve the body. But if you don't know it, you're just scratching your head saying, yeah, this guy has swing and miss issues. But well, yeah, he does. But those are some of those swing and, miss, swing and miss issues are correctable in their body issues. And if you don't know the answer to what the body is, you can't ever get to the root, root of the problem. Yeah, I mean, it take, and it takes it takes a village. I mean, that's that's one of those things. Like you know, as you start talking about all that stuff, it's you know, timing and how timing then also comes off of different things. So whenever I hear timing, I was like, this is this is one of my always things. Because whenever I ask hitters, I'm like, how do you how are you feeling? And one of their things is, and I think as coaches, not all coaches are aware that once you put a thought in a in a player's mind they take as that's who they are. So I'll get kids that'll come in. I'm like, Hey, you know, what are you feeling today in your swing? As we went through this first round of, you know, let's say live. And they're like, yeah, I just feel like my timing's off. Say, okay. So what feels like it's off in your timing? So I said, there's different ways to look at timing. And we, I feel like for so long, timing has been in this one, one box window of like my timing's off because I'm not starting on time. I'm starting early. I'm starting late. Yada, yada, yada. I'm like, well, in my mind, when I watch most people, and, and when I say most, I'm going to say the majority of people, their timing isn't off on when they start. The majority of their timing is it takes them too long to get to the ball with the swing. So there are two different things. I can be on time with the pitch, but if my time to impact isn't there, my timing is going to feel off because it's going to feel like the ball is getting there and I'm not there yet. And I think most hitters then just, you know, immediately, like if, if they're late on the ball and they're filleting balls the other way, you know, cause like, oh, your timing's off. You got to get your foot down earlier, you know? And then if you get into that mode and then this hitter comes in like, oh, my timing's off. So it's, I gotta, I gotta do this as my adjustment. And I'm like, you know, honestly, like timing is timing to me is as simple as if, if you are standing in front of me and I take a baseball and I throw it to you and your hand is open and it hits your hand, it falls to the ground and then you close your hand, that is bad timing. <laughs> if the ball's coming and you close your hand, then the ball hits your hand and then you, and then you like open your hand to like, oh, where was the ball? That is bad timing. But if I throw you the ball and you can squeeze your hand while you're watching something coming at you, that is timing. Most people start with decent timing to a pitch. Now there are people that don't, 100%. But a lot of them, a lot of them do. And a lot of the people we make start earlier, like we say, hey, you need to get your foot off the ground sooner to give yourself time, are people that have more time to impact issues. So they need to start sooner so that they can get things moving to give them a chance to get up to speed with the swing or the time to the ball to get there. So, you know, you look at how then the, all the body affects, like even like time to impact affects like when a person needs to start and what their tempo needs to look like. So again, you're sitting here rewinding these things of like, what are all the absolutes of like, of these things? And I don't, I, I, you know, every person is so different. It's hard to, honestly, even sitting here, it's hard to explain, I think in my mind to myself sometimes of like the amount of different things is like the same odds as, as the lottery. You look at every single person and go, man, this, this person can fall into like hundreds of thousands of different categories and we can't help them all because you can't micromanage because then kids, kids as a whole feel like they're, that they're supposed to be perfect. Like there's an end all be all. There's a, there's a final goal that I'm eventually going to get to. Nobody's going to be perfect. And a lot of times it's, Hey, I've gotten, I've gotten close enough where I can live and I just need a ton of reps at, this movement style that I don't need to keep looking for the next change. 
because we've coached them to, to think that way. Like, oh, there's got to be something next. Well, what's next? I've got, I feel like I've got pretty good at this, but what's next? Yeah. What, what, what is that with a player? Let's say, and I'll give you some numbers here. If a, somebody's on a blast sensor and their time to impact is 0. 0.17, 0. 0.18, let's say an amateur player. And they are mechanically efficient. What's the issue? So you've got, you've got a guy that you're telling me now. Low time impact. So you're saying they have to start sooner. They're going to make probably bad swing decisions. But what's your mechanically efficient? What, what are you defining as mechanically efficient? You don't see slack in the system. Okay. So you're, so you're saying there's no, there's no essential lag from segment to segment. I have an answer. I'm just curious to see what your answer is. No, that's a, that's a good question. I like I like that. I'm actually sitting here going, okay, so because I don't I'm not know. I'm trick you here, Travis. Yeah, well, no, I, I'm just I saying. Don't I don't know that I've seen tons of tons of that. So I would say that there's got to be some sort of. If, if my first thing I would look at is there's some sort of D cell issue, or there is some lack of commitment in the swing, because I could be efficient but not committed to a swing, and it's going to take me longer to get there. Yeah, I think the D cell is on the right track. I was I was going to go simpler than that. Like just sheer strength. Like I am not, I'm not strong enough to stabilize or get segments to decel so I can accelerate the next ones we mentioned earlier. And that goes back to our, our thought and we're not trying to kill our own business here, but because we have a ton of little kids that take lessons and that's fine. Like we, we are in a unique area um, where the socioeconomic level and the population are both really high. So we get a ton of, kids that come in and their parents just want them to have a good experience in the game of baseball. Maybe they don't know a whole lot about it, but they had the economic means to get Johnny in and take lessons. But I'll say, even with these youngest kids, our instructors do a really good job. Travis, I think of, of Dan Cannon, who does a lot of youth lessons. The first thing that he does is take the kid in the weight room. And it may be just, it may be a 30 minute lesson. It may be five or 10 minutes, but our point of that is, it's less about specialization with any player. It's more, and you say this all the time, Travis, really well, become a better athlete, get stronger. And there's so much structured play with kids today that the things that we had when we were little, you know, out on the playground, they don't have that today. But that's real, right? Like, um, I think of the ability to stop and start in running, like playing tag has D cell factors in it. Um, climbing on the monkey bars gets you stronger in your scaps. Some things that are very relative to baseball, kids don't do because play is all structured now. But what, what can you hit on, you know, on the athleticism part of that with, with youth athletes on what truly makes them better baseball players or just better at sports? Yeah, I mean, even y yesterday. So there's, there's a kid that comes in. Um, he pitches with me. He is 10. He's 10 years old. He is one of the best functional movers that I've seen probably in the entire time that I've taught baseball as a mover at 10 years old. How, how do you identify for our listeners? How do you identify that he's a good functional mover? What's that even mean? I'm going to ask you a question. Um, what, at, what functions do you think he does as a kid outside of baseball that have allowed him to become a better functional mover. I know you always touch on, hey, the kids do these couple of things as kids. They tend to be better movers in our sport in particular. What yeah, activities did you have? My own child who did both of these and not because I wanted her to be a better baseball or softball player. In fact, she had really no interest in baseball or softball at the time. But she at five did competitive wrestling and competitive gymnastics. And I, I saw her go into – and she really likes CrossFit because I was before I before I started with two full time jobs. I spent all my time competing in CrossFit on, on my extra time, and so she hung around the gym with me. And it was uncanny to me that things that would take me, man, sometimes a year to be proficient at a movement like the coordination of a butterfly pull up, um, she could learn it like in a day. Now kids are sponges, right? But her body control and awareness was something that I just didn't have in those two sports. For me, gymnastics and wrestling for youth athletes always shortens that curve of their ability to pick up movement and be more proficient at it. I don't know if that's where you're going to go with that or not. I asked this kid because I remember the first time he came in, he came in and we, you know, we did, we did a little bit of an assessment and went through 
just like a overall general, like we normally do like an observation. So after the assessment, we do an observation, like let's watch this athlete move before we talk about, you know, what we're going to have to do to maybe get the segments to work better together if he is a good mover or if he's not. And he started throwing a little bit and I was like, what other sports do you play? Cause in my mind, like this kid's gotta be doing something. And goes, we always ask that right. In their first, first lesson. Yeah. First thing he says, gymnastics, I go, well, I get it now. Yeah. So to go back to your point, which I just want to rewind to that. Cause I thought like, as soon as he said that, I immediately thought of you. Cause you know, I remember you always being like, Hey, gymnastics, wrestling, like those body control kind of sports tend to lead to better movers. So to your point about like, he functionally moves well, like his hinges work really well. So he hinges, he, his squat pattern is crazy for a 10 year old. Like most people I'm like, Hey, if it's a good squat, a good, a good way you can typically tell even just a simple version of a good squat is if there is no foot movement, if the foot can stay completely still where it's not, it's not heel coming off the ground. The toes aren't rotating outward during the squat means that there's probably a decent pattern happening above it. And you can usually just tell simply because the feet don't have to bail out some other part of the body that doesn't move well. Hold that thought for a minute and come back to it. Because I, I, I thought of this with, and anybody that's listening to this that has children, especially if you have really young children right now, who has the best squat patterns that I've ever seen? Toddlers. And I have no idea what happens to the human body that takes them out of that ability. I think of my, and I, I used to notice it because I had on my second child, I would watch them go down to pick something up. A toddler, because their head is so heavy, doesn't bend over at the waist to do that. They go into a really deep squat and put their hands down between their legs and pick something up. And I look at those patterns. I was like, oh, my God, that's like a perfect squat pattern. Who taught this toddler how to do that? Nobody. Right. So what happens to the human body that we, we get out of those proficient patterns that can be ingrained at, at youth? Oh, injury. Strength. You know, I, I see a lot of things, you know, the same thing that I was guilty of when I first started teaching baseball I, I was gonna say somebody coaching you out of it that's, say that's not the right way right or even just over coaching yeah that's what i mean yeah. to the point where somebody's so thoughtful about how they move they're so thoughtful about how they move that they're moving poorly because of it you know now wait a minute we just told everybody they need to learn human movement to be a better coach now you're saying you're over coaching if you learn if you talk about human movement so where's right. the where's the happy medium the, well there's the there's the tough part of everything that happens you know it's like if you in my mind, it's, it's still, you're taking something difficult. And again, you're trying to package it in a way that somebody isn't, and some people need more information. We know that as, as, as people that, that teach people on a daily basis, some people need more information to figure things out. Some people need less. I always say this, if you take the average person that's in high school, because now they've lifted weights for, you know, probably a couple of years and you say, Hey, without any, weight no bar no ex, no no outside weight and you have them do a squat say show me what you think a perfect squat looks like and you videotape that squat and then you load let's say 80 percent of what their max squat weight is so that there's enough that they have to actually find a way to move and you videotape that squat and you look how those squats are different because a lot of people, when they're going to like what the perfect squat is, it's always like, well, my back's got to be here and I got to do this here and I got to move there. And they're thinking about how to be perfect in a squat versus like, what do I need to do to get this function to work? So after years of either weakness or poor movement or fatigue or whatever ends up being the case, we create some bad patterns or we're put in a bad position. I was go, I go back to day one when we first started doing the movement assessments and we were out getting certified and they started talking about the squat patterns. And I immediately was like, Oh crap. Because the squat pattern was the first thing that really hit home with me because I had multiple ankle injuries as a kid. I might've rolled my ankle 12 times and some of them were, I literally couldn't walk on it for two weeks at a time. And I was like, nah, it'll go away. And you just kind of put some ginger weight on it a little bit. Never did anything to rehab my ankle because oh, I'm tough. Like it's good. I can be on it. And then I'd get in the weight room and I would have to widen my feet out just naturally. Like if I put the bar on my back 
my, you know, how you take the bar off the rack, you back off a little bit, and then you kind of like walk your feet till you feel what's comfortable. It's almost like your brain knows where it needs to be and it just moves until it gets there. My feet would always go super wide and my toes would always point out. And my strength coaches, I played football in high school as well. My strength coach was like, no, your feet need to be just outside your shoulder and you need to get your toes a little bit more forward. And I would go there, I would go there and I could only get down into like maybe a half a squat until it was either like, I'm not strong in this position or it hurt. And the reason why is my ankle mobility wouldn't let me create flexion. So then my knee would have to compensate. My hip would have to turn. But as soon as I went super wide and my toes went out, and I didn't know this at the point when I was, I didn't know this in high school. I just know what felt right. And the issue then would become like either A, I need to stay in that pattern or B, I'd have to crack the ankle. But nobody was telling me. And even though I probably should have done something to correct the ankle, I didn't know any better. I was a kid. So that's what I'm saying. Like the overcoaching is like, if realistically, if they would have left me alone, I would have been better than if they helped me. Or if there was an assessment they could have done and said, man, your ankle mobility is crap. Like we either need to clean up that ankle. Otherwise we do have to probably keep you in this pattern. And that was the thing. It was, there was, we didn't have as much of that. And I don't blame my strength coaches either. I mean, when we were in the weight room, there's a strength coach when I was growing up with 40 players, like they don't have time to sit and, and, and do all this different stuff, but they'd be walking back. Hey, why are your feet so wide? And that was it. And then they'd walk away and you'd narrow your feet because they're your coach and you just go and do it, you know? And then you're like, it doesn't feel right. And then as soon as they'd walk away, you'd go back to put your feet where they feel it. Because I want, I want to lift as much. Yeah, sure. I want to lift as much as my friends. <laughs> if I go feet closer, I can do like maybe body weight. Do you have equal external rotation to both hips or is one more than the other? Um, now I do not. I did, I did probably even two years ago. Um, but because my ankle's still bad, now my, my right hip is definitely tighter than my left. Because my now, right I have more mobility in my right, and I feel like it's because I've loaded into that right hip internally so many times as a hitter. And I think I asked you this. This is, again, how sick my mind works. I was like, you know how I, I think I know that, like, in my squat pattern, my right foot is more externally rotated? And here's how I, I figure out like my natural base of my squat or my feet or what they look like. My feet are turned out the same way. And so this is, this is really twisted, but think about this. The next time you go take a leak, look down at your feet while you're doing it. Because your feet are going to be in a position that will tell you how much external rotation you probably have in each hip. Because my right foot sticks out more than angle than my left one does. And I was like, huh, that's interesting because I'm definitely more mobile in that hip. That's just the way I naturally stand. That's, how about that one? Yeah, you'd expect that one. No, but that's true too. That, 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 no, but that's one of those things too. Like when we talk about, you know, either A, this, this player needs to be more mobile or not more mobile. You know, and a lot of times, like you said, like there's certain ranges of motion that need to be there. Like as a throwing athlete, right? Like my external rotation in my throwing arm is exceedingly greater than my non-throwing arm. Now I have relatively the same overall range of motion in the arm. Um, but it's just, it's led more one way on the throwing side simply because of necessity. Like there has to be more, well, there has to be essentially more layback for more possibility of output. So if I would say, Hey, I've got to make both sides equal. I would lose velocity to do so. But, you know, changing the range of motion also puts you in different positions that sometimes are more likely to cause injury. So, you know, you look at all of that. And again, this is like, for how many tangents we've now gone off on simply on talking about absolutes, like what's the absolute of this? Like we were told, like, you know, the body needs to be asymmetric. Well, sometimes as an athlete, the body needs to not be asymmetric because it's trying to create something and to create it, it has to be slightly imbalanced to create it. And then you look at it later in life and you're like, man, like why are a lot of athletes looking like, you know, they, they don't walk as great when they get older because they've created imbalances that they needed to be good at something. And then in everyday life, as they get older and the body becomes a little bit weaker and it doesn't recover as fast, if those imbalances don't work their way back out, it's like, oh, well, 
you know, now you've got some back pain and now you've got some, you know, other things that are, are happening later because you did that. So this is all the athletes as you're getting out of sports, get your body back in balance for everyday life. Yeah. Like when- I, I remember, remember Dr. Scott Lynn uh, was talking about the work he was doing over, I, I believe the Toronto Maple Leafs. And we were talking about counter movement jump in the loading phase on the force plate and how I was saying, man, these, these asymmetries with players are in, likely to lead to hamstring pulls. And he goes, I don't know if I agree with that because this, whoever, this famous player he named, I don't know hockey very well, but from the Maple Leafs, he goes, this guy had like a 80, 20 asymmetry. And it was just something that had to do with the way he skated, did his slap shot, et cetera. Uh, but I was going to say that you talk about ankle mobility and think about how often we see how undervalued the ankle is in the, like for pitching and hitting in the loading mechanism itself. Like if you don't have good ankle mobility and we see that's probably one of the biggest areas of flaw in our movement assessments, the ankles typically pop up with probably 50% or more of the population. Um, You have a hard time holding a hip hinge. You're likely going to work out into your forward move faster. And it's not a flaw of something that you've been improperly coached on. It's like your body can't do this. And you saw me tweet this this summer as I was watching, uh, we, we, this was before baseball started again. So ESPN was doing all the replay games and I was watching Cal Ripken Jr.'s 21-31 game. And I noticed and joked with you, Travis, that all the players were wearing high tops. I'm like, oh, what? A, and I did too, because King Ripken Jr. did in high school. When I was in high school, I wore high tops. What a horrible idea for baseball players. A horrible idea. Like, let's limit the players' ankle mobility even more. And think about all the like sweet potential swing flaws that were coming out of, of doing that. So for anybody who wants to make a really, really good baseball shoe that is effective for pitchers and hitters, find a way to make it like a slipper with just enough stability uh, that will allow you not to get hurt, but give you as much free range of motion as possible because the ankle often needs it. Now, circling back, proficient movers. Your proficient mover, your 10-year-old that came in there and we, we got into the squat pattern, you said, you were watching him do this squat, and he was a wrestler. Continue with your story there. What do you end up seeing with him? Goodness, yes. So he also has, for his age, exceedingly good pelvic control. So whenever I look at an athlete as a whole now versus what I would look for before, I typically look for, to start with, the middle of the body. So what is the ability to control the pelvis, the lumbar, what is the what is the ability then to control hinges because then it's always like how do we flow from one piece to the next piece because that's what's always happening there's always multiple things like we talked about earlier happening one thing at a time so this kid came in and going back to that story i sat and watched the move and i'm like man like this guy's got really good body control and he's a good mover um he's got good control of a lot of the functions of his body and when he threw i'm like he puts himself, he, get, he can get himself in and out of positions better than a lot of kids that I have that are even, you know, division one or pro athletes at this point. And you're just like, like how, how is it that this kid at 10 can do things for himself so well? So when he comes in, it's like, okay, well, I'm not, I, we, for what it's worth, we don't talk about, we don't talk about mechanics when he comes in we don't talk about what you would call mechanics i hate to call them like i don't know why we've always called them mechanics we don't talk about it because in my mind he he does things so well that he's better off just continuing in the pattern he's in and then building like you said before building strength around it so at 10 his rotary stability and strength isn't great yet and it's usually one of the last things to come because you're not doing tons of rotary movements as a youth athlete or a kid in general. So we go back. First thing he does, he comes in, you know, we say, hi, I'm like, Hey, you know, how's your day? And as he's coming in, we immediately just walk straight back to the weight room. So two things that we do back there for him the two things we do for him is we do, we start doing like rotary functional strength. So whether it's, you know, we'll do, we'll do both sides of it. So we'll do the acceleration side of it and the deceleration side of it. So we'll do some rotary throws or some rotary band pulls. Um, we'll do some eccentric and concentric with the band. So we'll do some just like stationary. We'll do some isometric ones as well like that. We'll do the rotating. We'll do, we'll do um, slow coming back. 
and then we'll do a bunch of D cell stuff um, for, for rotation. And then it'll be like, all right, how are you feeling? And it's funny because you'll watch him. And like, for as much as he succeeds in everything when he's out throwing the ball, and I'm sure he does in gymnastics as well, his, like, he, we did it yesterday and his rotary strength and his rotary stability is average. So he comes in, we do that. And again, in that day, it's like, hey, we're going to go out and throw. This is, hey, yeah, a little bit of what you should be trying to do a little bit of on a daily basis or every other day basis at home because we're not fatiguing the muscle. But then we're also prepping it, saying, listen, like you're not going to build this in one day, but let's prep your body to move better today and know what it feels like to move better. His second thing that we do is we do, because it's going to apply forever for any athlete, is just rate of force development. So we do a lot of jumps. So, you know, after we got done in the weight room, we came back out of the cage. We did um, a couple just high jumps. So basically just jump as high as you can. Um, usually I'll let them have like a soft landing on the first couple. And then we do a little bit more of a rigid landing following that just to force the muscle to have to turn on a little bit quicker to, to stabilize body weight faster. Then we'll go into broad jumps. Um, in our broad jumps, we do the same thing. So in our broad jumps, the first couple jumps, I let them have a little bit of a softer landing. And then next couple, I make them stick the end of the broad jump. Um, then we'll go into typically like, we'll break it from two legs into one leg. And then we'll go into one leg and we'll start doing basically like a one-legged, just call it bound, I guess you'd call it. So you're, you're using one leg and you're trying to cover as much distance from jump to jump. So concurrent jumps without a stop. Um, and going into that, it was, it was funny. Like his, his, his high jump was pretty good for a 10-year-old. His broad jump is probably farther than... I can jump, um, but this we got a baseball into, lesson, mind you, but we got into the one legged jumps and he would get through like two hops, like two concurrent hops. And then he would basically just like almost fall. So it's another thing. Like how often do we train even especially youth athletes? Cause even adult athletes, like how often do we actually train them on one leg? Yep. Cause these guys are always doing two legged squats and two legged yep. this and two legged that. And they're not doing a lot of one. So for him, it was like that. And he, he, he was struggling. He was, you can tell he's a competitor because he was kind of upset. He's like, oh, let me do one more. I'm like, no, like, let's, we're still going to get into our throwing today. But you're more than welcome to do these at home. I don't ever tell you, like, this, you need to do this at home. I hate to do, like, this is what you need to do. Yes, your homework. Like, yeah. And the parents always ask, well, what, what, what should we do? Like, well, you should be doing everything we're doing in here. It just repeat it. <laughs> and not only <laughs> that, doing. If, you're, if, you're, if your son or daughter is coming in and they see that, man, like, I wasn't good at that one-legged jump, you don't need to tell me to go home and do one like it jumps. I'm gonna go home and I'm gonna I'm gonna win. Like the, I'm gonna beat this. Like that was that sucked. I want to do better. I don't need somebody like, well, what should I do when I go home? Well, I don't know. How did you think you did those one legged jumps? Well, not good. And I'll look at him like, okay. So what do you think you should do when you go home? You know, and then go from there. So again, that was going back to your point you brought up about Dan and getting into like, you know, what are we looking for and what are we doing with athletes? Like it's, it's such a broad spectrum because there's other guys that come in. I've got high school guys that come in. And it's almost like, I always tell them like, you're at a point now where you have to make a decision. And I, I don't ever force them down a road. I said, you get to make the decision because at the end of the day, it's your, it's your life within this sport. It's your decision. It's nobody else's decision. I will give you my opinion, but that doesn't mean my opinion is going to even be the best thing for you. So you certain people, you're like, hey, listen, at your age, with where you're at, you've got two choices. You can either keep going down this path because that's the way you've kind of already built yourself to be, or you can make a change. And that change sometimes is literally finding the reset button. Like your pattern of movement may have limitations. You may be able to fight through that and continue on this process. But there's a lot of times there's it's not little tweaks because you're talking about guys that are saying i want to play at a high level for a long time yeah, and pattern like, changes are tough like rewriting the pattern it's it's a tough it way to be, but sometimes necessary and but for older kids it's way tougher because like you like you're saying your point before with the older kids it's so ingrained and it is, it is now a, it's it's now a part of them it's their safety blanket to move the way they've always moved because they're comfortable there and once you take a kid adult once you take anybody out of comfortability you start running into panic because when they can't immediately do what they need to do or it feels awkward they panic because they're worried that they're going to regress which sometimes is the need like sometimes we have to actually go a little bit backwards to go forward but it's hard to get somebody to understand that you know because 
when they see like, Hey, I've been doing this now for two weeks and I'm not getting, you know, everything I wanted to get out of this. I'm like, listen, in your mind, tell yourself that this might have to be six months. Now yeah. you might not like, you might not like that, but th tell yourself you might need to give yourself six months for you to actually not only have created a better pattern, but then had enough reps in that pattern where you're actually not, I always call it renting the move versus owning the move. When you first try something new, you're just borrowing it. Like you don't own that move yet. You're just figuring out how to do it. And then once you've done that move long enough, you start to own that move where you can do that in any position at any time, whenever. And that takes time. And when you're changing people, like that's the issue you run into, you know? So starting at a young age, like now it's like, it's awesome having younger kids come in because you look at them like, man, okay, this kid, this kid, you can tell already has played sports because they already move pretty well. And then you get the, the kids that come in, you're like, okay, this kid probably hasn't done much. So we do spend a little bit more time, like functionally becoming better movers and a little less time throwing. And sometimes you're like, well, when are we going to throw? I'm like, we'll throw. I said, and they don't get it. And you're also trying to make it fun. So there's that whole part where the younger kids are like, well, I can't just, we can't just do functional moving because they're coming here because they love baseball. We got to throw, but then when they throw or they hit and they're not hitting the ball or they're not throwing well, then they're upset with themselves. And you're like, well, this is, this is the whole circle, man. Like, it's like, you know, how, how do you accomplish something without taking away? Like, I want them, I want them to want to come back because they like the sport, not because I need them to come back because I want them to love the sport. I want them to feel like, Oh, I feel like I can do better if I'm there. Cause that's part of it too. Like just the reassurance, you know? So there's just so many things that go into like everyday life in a cage. You know, it's like, you're, you're having to analyze like their emotions for the day, you know, <laughs> like, like it's, it's crazy. Like it's, there's so many variables, you know, give parents an example of that movement part of it that goes into a lesson. I think of like Zion Williamson where, he was drafted one of the one of the most elite players to come out of the draft in a long time and they wouldn't let him play because he had so many issues with functional movement that they went back and corrected they until you correct these movements you're not getting on the court in a competitive atmosphere so like rewriting the pattern of one of the most elite athletes in the world now he probably was able to do it a little quicker than you and I because he is an elite athlete and that's a a neurological thing that we can get into in a later date, but that's like, this happens at the very highest level. But I think back to like amateur players that you're interested in, in the draft. Sometimes I write, this is a complete pattern change. And that's, there has to be patience in that because that, that takes, that takes a while. I have a couple more points here to circle it back here, Travis, going back to your rotary stability issue for your young athlete. I have a player that often sends me videos of him chopping down trees in, in rural Georgia. And he uses the ax as his baseball swing. And I look at him getting the ax into the tree and holding that position at contact, which he likes to feel strong at contact. I was like, my God, what a good rotary stability drill because the ax forces you, you can't over rotate off of that. Like you're, you're sticking it, it's hit and stick. I think back to, and I don't do this drill in the academy, but we have a couple of heavy bags. And this is like, this is not earth shattering. People do this in academies all over the country. But that drill for young kids is actually a good one. I thought about that. That's like, and I've seen you do it working on vertical bat angle to show them, but to stick something hard at contact and hold that position without your body flailing away from it is actually a good rotary stability trainer. So there's a drill for that. We, uh, it's funny because like the things that we did sometimes as a kid, like I don't even know why we did half the crap we did, you know, like we had growing up, we it had a tire, right? We didn't know why we were doing it, but some right. we had a tree swing tire yeah. and we used it for swing. That's a good drill. Yeah. That's one day you're out in the yard and like, you know what? I'm just going to hit this thing with my bat. I don't know. I'm not going to break the tire. So let's hit it. Like that's, that's actually a really good drill. If you can stick that position. So that circle it back here. It, there are some, some really good, even things that we did 40 years ago, 30 years ago, that you can apply like, oh, that has good movements within it. So there's, there's a lot of ways to skin the cat. There's not anything that's like new school that's, that you can't find a good position out of an old drill, right? And that goes back to, there are no absolutes, man. Like you, you can find so many ways to get to the end goal. But one of the things that was consistent from this message that we talked about today is that there are a, are a sequence 
of hundreds, if not thousands of body positions and movements that a player has to do to be efficient and being a better mover and a better athlete and having an understanding of what that looks like and actually is, um, is a really, in my opinion, is a really important facet to coaching. And you see a lot of organizations are looking for people that have that dynamic skill set of, I have feel of the game. I, I have feel of being in the dirt, but I also understand the body a little bit. Anything you want to touch on to, to finish that up, Travis? Yeah, I mean, you you got it right there. You know, I think, you know, there's so much that goes into being an athlete these days. You know, I think, you know, to my, from my perspective, the fact that, you know, we're letting athletes be more of themselves within a system, you know, with, there's a system that we're still, we know that there's things that don't apply even maybe necessarily to the body quite as much, you know, that it's like, Hey, you're, if your timed impact is good and your line to the ball is good, and your decision making is good. You're in a good spot. Yeah, see ball, hit ball. Well, but you might not. You might not be strong. Well, but you might not be strong enough to drive a ball to the ballpark yet. You know, and some of that comes with time. You know, but I think too, like you know, you look at a lot of these these kids. You know, their feel for the game isn't always there early because they're still trying to figure out how to move. Like they don't feel comfortable in the way that they're moving because they're not maybe making contact the way they want. And it's hard to have feel for the game when you don't feel like you're playing the game well enough. You know, and I think that part of it goes to it as well as like, you know, now that there's so much information, sometimes it's an overload. Yeah. You know, they're, they're always looking for the next and you lose that, that feel you're searching out those absolutes. Like what, like how, if you would go on right now and type in like how to create more bat speed, how many, how many links pop up? Oh man tens of thousands and like like some of them are just like you look at it like well when was this one put on the internet in in 19 19- text me that question yesterday is because there's a a uh, high profile player that has average to below average bat speed and he's efficient like what do you do and they go at this point outside of getting stronger i can't tell you a whole lot <laughs> yeah so i mean you, but you look at that and you're like well <laughs> yeah but that's good uh, enjoy talking. Good to have you back on the show today, Travis. We'll see you guys next week. Catch us on Apple, iTunes, and Spotify. Uh, we'll see you on the field.